Thank you for joining us today for the Christian Richardson Intellectual Property Protection for Defense Contractors webinar. For all of you that are veterans out there, I wish you a happy Veterans Month. Thank you for your service. My name is Tom Roslovich, and today I'm joined by my colleagues, Matt Colvin, Tom Helkowski, and Joel Henry. Today we'll discuss IP protection in the defense industry. I'll just note by way of background that Joel, Matt, and I are proud Air Force veterans for reservists. By way of background, my practice emphasizes post grant proceedings and portfolio management. Prior to becoming an attorney, I worked at the Pentagon at the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisitions and Technology, and later at Fort Meade as an Information Security Technology Specialist. Matt Colvin is a principal in our Dallas office and works in our litigation group. Matt helps clients with litigation and IP portfolio development in a, com in a competitive landscape. Joel Henry is a principal in our Washington, D.C. office. Joel is an officer in the Air Force Reserve, where he presently serves with U.S. Cybercom at Fort Meade. Joel also served for several years at the Pentagon prior to his current assignment with Cybercom. Joel's legal practice emphasizes software and hardware technologies for machine learning and AI systems, as well as post grant proceedings at the PTAP. Tom Halkowski litigated patent cases in courts across the country, including multiple cases for government contractors and cases in the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. Tom started out at the Justice Department litigating cases routinely in the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. Our biographies and the New York, New Jersey blank CLE form are available for download on your control panel. Please note that you must be logged into the webinar on your device in order to receive CLE credit. You will not receive credit for listening to the audio portion only. Now, today's webinar will run for one hour and include a question and answer period at the end of the program. You may ask questions at any time in the program in the Q&A section of, of your control panel. We'll do our best to answer all of these at the end of the presentation, time permitting. Please also feel free to contest, contact us all personally after the webinar. I would also like to mention our next upcoming program taking place Thursday, December 7th, where my colleagues Megan Chacon and Chrissy Brown Marshall will host the 2023 Hatch Waxman Year in Review webinar. Before we get started, I should remind you that the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fish and Richardson and is not intended to address every court or case situation. And that will, with that, we'll go ahead and begin. If we can go to the next slide, please. Here's the agenda for today's presentation. We'll start off speaking to some of the industry perceptions and challenges, we'll speak to the landscape of IP and defense, touch upon the um, tremendously innovative environment uh, that goes into supporting uh, the Department of Defense. We'll speak to the time frame of intellectual property relative uh, to uh, the contracting and the patent system. We'll touch upon licenses, patent rights with the government, litigation, and revenues and objectives. Next slide, please. Now, Matt, Hi, everyone. This is... Hi, everyone. This is Matt Colvin. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I want to start by talking a little bit about some of the industry perceptions around intellectual property. Uh, as we work with uh, companies in the defense and defense contracting communities, we often hear uh, refrains such as, you know, don't worry about patenting things because the government's going to take it anyway. Uh, you know, nobody in the defense industry worries about patents or IPs, or even if you do, uh, there's really nothing you can do about it. In the tech industry, when when we uh, uh, talk to those people about you know potentially moving into the government contracting space, um, oftentimes they're not interested in it because they think that the government uh, contracting and, and defense contracting area is is slow. Uh, it's not a high growth environment, and it's just not innovative like the commercial sector is. It's been our experience, and, and the data shows that, that this is just wrong. Um, and if you you know, fall prey to these misconceptions, um, you're going to lose leverage, you're going to miss contracts, and, and you're not going to be prepared um, to defend your ideas uh, and your intellectual property in the event that you find yourself in litigation. So as we go throughout this presentation today, uh, we're really going to be dispelling some of these myths. Next slide, please. These are just some of the headlines uh, that you see uh, when you search for, you know, defense contractors winning contract, uh, winning intellectual property disputes with the government. Um, as you can see, there is big money here. 
Um, and uh, we're going to touch on some of these in greater depth later in the presentation. But the takeaway here is that none of this would be possible if the contractors didn't have their own intellectual property. Um, next slide. Yeah, Joel, maybe if I can ask you to speak to the landscape for what is a defense contractor and maybe speak to the, the relative sizes of, of who we define as a defense contract. Looks like Joel's having slight audio difficulties. So um, very quickly, here we see the legal definition of a defense contractor, which is any individual firm or corporation partnership that does um, enters into a contract directly with the Department of Defense to furnish services, supplies, or construction. We certainly see some of the, the most prominent names in the industry, um, companies such as Lockheed Martin and Raytheon, but I think it's also important to note that uh, while many of these uh, contractors are prime contractors, there is a perhaps equally large ecosystem of subcontractors and small, small entities that are providing key technical expertise on larger contracts. In some cases, they might be doing a proof of contract, a proof of concept under a, a, a DARPA or ESPER grant. Esper grant. I am Tom. Can you hear me? Am I, is my audio coming through? The audio is coming through. The audio is coming through now. Yeah. Apologies for the technical difficulties there. Um, yeah. Thank you for for that analysis, Tom. I was saying earlier that certainly I think there's some. Uh, misconceptions out there that defense contractors are you know, mainly the larger well-known tech entities such as the ones listed here right your Lockheed's your Boeing's your Raytheon's um, but you know as, as, as you alluded to Tom you know in, in actuality the definition of, of who qualifies as a defense contractor is quite broad right so as shown here it's essentially any non-federal entity you know, irrespective of size that enters into a contract uh, with the DOD to provide goods and or services. So um, I think, you know, having an understanding, uh, yeah, having an understanding of this broad definition, I think is particularly important if you're a smaller entity handling contract obligations that perhaps are not in the billions uh, as listed here, but uh, in, the, in the hundreds of, of thousands or even millions. Um, certainly, you know, understanding that you, that, you know, those smaller entities certainly uh, can be designated as, as as defense contractors, and I think that plays a role in how you um, negotiate contract terms with the government and the DOD. Next slide, Great. Great. So this is Matt Colvin again. Um, we're showing here on the screen a, a profile of large defense contractors, and we're doing this uh, to kind of dispel the notion that uh, defense contractors are not pursuing IP, because they absolutely are. Um, we're showing here the number of patent families worldwide and then the number of active US patents for you know, a selection of, of really some of the largest uh, defense contractors. You can see that you know, uh, some of these companies have patent portfolios in the tens of thousands. Um, next slide. But it's not just the really large defense contractors that are pursuing IP. Some smaller defense contractors also have robust IP portfolios. Um, some of these names uh, won't be familiar to you because they're just not the large household defense contractor names that, uh, that are often uh, talked about. Uh, some of them, uh, obviously, you will have heard of, but, but others you won't. And they still have very large uh, portfolios uh, to protect their their intellectual property. Next slide. Thank you, Matt. Uh, this is Tom Rosalovich again. And I think it's important to point out that there really is no shortage of innovation uh, for those that are supporting uh, the Department of Defense. Well, oftentimes, I think we think of innovation as being tied to a particular economic cycle. Here, I think the innovation coming out of the defense industrial base is, is really unsurpassed. Uh, if we look at the example, some of the technology initiatives that have grown out of uh, DARPA and ESPER innovation, you've got everything from, from GPS, there's been a, a number of cybersecurity uh, innovations and really very successful programs and, and in fact uh, IP programs associated with those programs as well. Uh, the internet, um, going from the um, 
and, and Ethernet going back to the early days of Aloha certainly represents, represents another area. Uh, there's been any number of personal voice assistants that I think uh, most prominently grew out of some of the, the West Coast research institutions. Uh, cloud computing for everything that represents today, I think was, was commonly considered to grow out of the MIT Multics program. I believe the uh, graphical user interfaces and the use of the mouse grew out of uh, uh, user interface research in the uh, late 60s. And I think it's important to point out that the, the operations and the applicability often go beyond their, their core competencies. I, I think it's um, a mistake to sometimes look at the innovation as only, only going into the, the near-term commercialization objective. I, I think what we see for certainly the spread of the technology and, and thus the IP that's tied to this technology has broad applicability beyond the, the near-term one to two-year commercialization objectives. Um, you know, one thing I would also point out to the uh, uh, defense contractors pointed out earlier is that while many of the uh, listed companies are very impressive system, impressive system manufacturers, uh, many also have equally large software development operations and IT operations, and that can be just a productive ground of, of innovation as, as other grounds. Next slide, please. Thanks, Tom. Sure. So here we highlight sort of the general time frame of, of patent filings uh, in, the time, in the context of the, the CIBR program. So uh, CIBR here, Small Business Innovation Research Program, right? So using DARPA as an example, right? If you're selected as an award uh, recipient or you receive a grant um, from DARPA to develop uh, a system for, for national security, those, those grant time frames usually range from about three to five years, and what we've noticed is that dove, that you know that time frame dovetails nicely with the duration for uh, prosecution and issuance um, with a patent at the at the patent office. So um, you know again, in the context of of the cyber program, if you're a small business, um, you know there's certainly an opportunity here to 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 leverage this this program uh, coordinated by the Small Business Administration. Uh, to help, you know, sort of secure these awards and conduct research and development in this space, uh, particularly in the defense space, right? As noted here, uh, the uh, awards are in the $2.5 billion range uh, each year, and the DOD is the one of the largest agencies uh, of this program, so leveraging small businesses to, to provide you know, different, different uh, high-tech solutions. I can tell you, you know, as an example, when, during my time at the Pentagon, we worked with several uh, small businesses, uh, small entities, smaller entities for for you know, software solutions, codings, source code for mapping toolkits, um, things of that sort. Um, and some of those entities did pursue uh, patent filings on some of those technologies within the scope of of the DFARS and and you know the, the sort of the appropriate process for for that uh, for that endeavor. So you know certainly you know just wanted to flag the uh, the opportunities with the CIPR program uh, and and the potential for for grants, not just obviously with DARPA, but with other agencies that are focused on high-tech applications. Next slide, please. And again, continuing with the theme of uh, sort of timelines for obtaining patents here, uh, this, this filing timeline covers the PCT process. Uh, PCT is Patent Cooperation Treaty. Um, that's the, the acronym there, but uh, in the larger sort of patent context, Right. You can pursue patents locally in different jurisdictions. The most obvious or most common filing area for us in the U.S. is obviously the U.S. Patent Office, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO. Um, but you can also pursue uh, international filing via the PCT route, which uh, essentially gives you a 30-month time frame for uh, pursuing patent uh, rights or technology internationally, right? So to the extent you're working with the government on some technology or some particular high-tech application, if you get the sense that there's there's a you know, sort of a commercial space or commercial appetite for that technology and there aren't you know, any sort of uh, security considerations or uh, you know, technology sensitivity considerations, then perhaps a international filing or PCT filing might be, might be attractive. So we were just highlighting that um, that sort of filing route as an, as an option here. And one other point in terms of uh, track one and accelerated examinations, uh, some entities will pursue track one filings to expedite uh, examination and securing a patent uh, for you know, various sort of strategic reasons. You could use the track one process if you anticipate 
uh, bidding on a you know, development contract or an, or, or, or an RFP for R&D efforts, excuse me, an RFP is a request for proposal. Um, so if you anticipate bidding on um, an existing request for proposal for research and development effort in, in a particular space, you can leverage perhaps the track one examination, at least in the US, to quickly secure or more, expedi more expeditiously secure a patent so that you can you know, sort of brandish that technology uh, when competing for those for those uh, for those awards. Next slide, please. One, one second, Joel, before we move on. Um, Matt, I think you're going to weigh in, and some of the questions we often see is that sometimes, uh, you know, how do you resolve what appears to be a complicated situation as to whether or not the government wants rights? Um, Matt, do you want to maybe weigh in on that? Sure. Thanks, Tom. Um, you know, the way to generally think about the allocation of rights with the government is, you know, the government's going to want uh, what they pay for, but it's still a negotiation. And so um, depending on, you know, the exact situation um, and, and the type of contract, um, uh, the, you know, your, your company may be able to certainly retain ownership of the IP and may be able to retain uh, all of the rights with respect to it. Um, so there's really not a one size fits all approach. Um, and, and the DARPA and the CIBR initiatives are really designed to promote innovation within these smaller companies and allow these smaller companies to uh, retain uh, their IP rights. Um, the government may get a limited use right, uh, depending on the, the circumstance, but um, certainly, uh, you know, these programs are designed so that the company that actually does the research um, is going to get the benefit from those IP rights and, and commercialization efforts, particularly if commercialization efforts are uh, are outside of the government. Uh, you could certainly imagine a technology that has, you know, government right, uh, a government use, and then also a commercial use outside of the government. Um, the government may get rights to the IP uh, for the government purpose, but uh, in almost all cases, the a company is going to retain the rights for use outside of the government. And just to piggyback on that, Tom, do we have time for an additional point? Or uh, absolutely. In fact, I have two questions for you to follow up on that. So go ahead, Joel. Yeah. So I think here, you know, this is a sort of a good opportunity to to emphasize having a comprehensive IP strategy in place to the extent you can before you start to enter into those substantive negotiations with the DoD. Or the government, uh, and one example would be, you know, identifying the scope of the IP that you have, understanding the extent to which the technology that you have aligns with the technology that is being requested or 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 identified by the government as an area of research and development. Right. So, to the extent that there's overlap, um, you know, for example, in some sensor technology or image processing technology, if there's overlap in your core. I, a core portfolio, you can, you know, you can identify those assets as background IP, and then you can, you know, sort of determine how you plan to negotiate those rights with the government and how you plan to negotiate um, rights with any potential foreground IP that comes out of um, the, the, the contract effort. Uh, so, you know, that's, uh, I guess I'll pause there, Tom, and, and, and take the questions that you mentioned you having. Yeah. Yeah, so I just kind of really want to emphasize one point you brought up here of the time frame of successfully securing IP relative to the time frame for the defense contracting system. So I want to be very clear here, maybe 20 years ago there was a stereotype that the patent system is just too slow, that programs succeed and or fail before the, the underlying IP gets examined and will, would grant us a patent. Can you maybe speak to how responsive and, and how fast the patent system can be in terms of going from filing a patent application to getting a granted patent and being able to assert it in the district court or, or perhaps license it. Is that for me, Tom? That is for you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I could I could take that. Um, yeah, so there's, you know, there are, the USPTO has a, a, a track one prioritized examination process. And the the sort of the high level answer is examination can be quite fast depending on the technology right so uh you know seven years ago when i was working in the in the processor design space for for implementing ai applications we were getting 
uh, awards quite quickly, even without the track one process, because the technology was was essentially quite new um, and it was not a crowded art space, so to speak. Um, so even uh, you know, I guess with that context, depending on you know sort of the complexity and, and newness and 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 sort of innovative flavor of the technology that you're working on, you can you know you can secure a patent uh, quite quickly, you know, four or five months, six months. Even with uh, you know, some crowded art spaces, you know, the, the 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 track one examination process certainly provides uh, opportunities to, to to quickly secure you know quality patents as well because the examiners are taking you know they're taking their time to sort of carefully review what you submitted and, and a lot of times there's negotiations and discussions with the examiners to to tailor scope um, to, to you know so they can we, you know they can get an issue and an allowance within the within a reasonable time frame under track one so. I'll pause there. Is that, does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Really, that the fact that cases are taking four or five years to grant that, in some cases, if it's important enough, you can see a patent grant in less than a year, which could be really, you can talk about the use of having a, a patent and grant in such a pretty short time, pretty short order. We had another question that uh, came in for you as well, and that really is um, looking at the slide in front of us right now. What are the optional reports? For example, I think we see some of the uh, the international search reports, the written opinions. At 22 months, we have, I think, with, in other circumstances, called the H chapter two demand to request preliminary examination. Joel, you maybe want to speak to what that is in the PCT and why it's significant. How how applicants can use that to advance their cause. Certainly, yeah. So, uh, and, and we could we could probably go on a whole hour on PCT prosecution, but uh, uh, from a high level, when you file a PCT application you designate uh, a receiving office. Uh, you know, some clients uh, designate the US, some clients designate Europe, right? So, so what that means is you get, a, you get a, an, an initial examination uh, in a national search report. So that's an examiner at, that, at, at the receiving office that you designate has picked up the application and they've done a preliminary examination. And they found what they think is uh, substantive prior art that might uh, preclude you from getting a patent on the claims that you, the claims of scope that you have in the application. The, the request for supplemental international search, um, that also relates to the examination process. Um, as indicated there, it's optional. The file for demand um, is, is, it relates to you know, amending the claims in view of the art found in the international search report. So uh, depending on the references cited in the search report, you, you may see that some references are problematic and then you, you amend the claim scope to expedite uh, getting a patent if and when you you proceed to the national phase uh, stage. So uh, I guess just to sort of summarize, these optional steps allow you opportunities to alter claim scope to expedite issuance when you get to the national phase stage. And the national phase stage is, is uh, again, the PCT application is essentially a placeholder. It's filed. You have up to 30 months to designate the, the entities or jurisdictions that you want to pursue patent protection in. So you can file a PCT and then at 30 months, say you want to pursue it in Europe, pursue it in the US, pursue it in China, pursue it in India, and then you can leverage the demand stage to alter claim scope to expedite allowance when you get into those jurisdictions on the back end. Thank you, Joel. And I'm sorry to put you on spot for another question. We had a very um, focused question, I think very much kind of speaks to uh, this application phase of, of the process. And let's imagine we have a contracting environment in which we're making proposals, we're getting feedback on our proposals, we're, we're maybe doing some early proof of concept. And so we're not necessarily, um, we may not have complete visibility into where our uh, inventive activity is taking place. The, you know, when are we about to disclose something? When are we getting feedback? Uh, we might be trying to see if, if, if things work. And I think there's, the, so the question that came in is, what happens if we go ahead and, and you know, the US is, is uh, does not have absolute novelty in terms of filing for a patent application. You can disclose something for up to a year and then conceivably go back and, and file for the patent application. But Joel, do you maybe want to speak to uh, how you account for what might be sometimes um, an unstructured innovative process, right? Because you're trying to build systems and deliver from the, the mission critical government objectives there and trying to reconcile that with the patent harmonization system, knowing that the um, Knowing that the, the U.S. operates, you know, gives you the one-year grace period, and, and the rest of the world, um, if you disclose things under other terms other than an NDA, you're precluded from pursuing that, and uh, basically throughout the whole rest of the world. Maybe you, I wonder if you might have some thoughts on how to uh, 
can maybe bring some structure to the that innovative process, trying to get patent applications around some things we don't necessarily have line of sight into all the innovation. Yeah, yeah. So that yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, there's a couple different approaches. I think the most common approach is to leverage the provisional filing, uh, provisional application filing process. Um, so again, just with the uh, understanding with respect to the grace period. So in the U.S., you can file a provisional application. We have some clients that file several provisional applications um, just to get that placeholder, right? Just to get their foot in the door at the patent office to establish a priority date for a particular scope of technology. And um, what happens after that is, you know, as to your point, as the discussions with the government mature or as the technology matures, uh, you can you can uh, you know, leverage the disclosure in the provisional application to file either a non-provisional application. Some clients file a second provisional application to just sort of iteratively, uh, you know, keep capturing priority for different scopes of technology. So, and you know, provisional applications are usually uh, a bit more cost-effective. They don't have the, they're not examined. Um, they're, you know, you can put as much into them as you want in terms of disclosure. It doesn't have to be structured in the in the normal patent format, but so long as the sort of technical substance is there, you can leverage um, that provisional filing to establish priority and, and you know, kind of hone the scope of the disclosure as, as, as technology discussions mature. Uh, and then also, given the absolute novelty requirement in other jurisdictions, for example, uh, in Europe, you can, uh, you know, file a PCT application off of the provisional, right? Because you can claim priority back to the filing date of the provisional. So it's, it's a really an attractive tool for for uh, you know, getting a, an early priority date and then sort of leveraging it to secure uh, rights in other jurisdictions, uh, Europe being the sort of the main one with with the absolute novelty requirement. Does, uh, does that sort of help to answer the question? I think you answered the question very well. And uh, two other points I might add on top of that. So the provisional patent applications, you know, that is the proverbial, proverbial Friday night cocktail napkin. It really does two other things, especially for two types of uh, clients. I'd say number one. If, if you're not sure a particular uh, direction a program might go, it may or may not be viable, uh, or just might have a great deal of uncertainty. So, so getting a placeholder um, on file just to document what you intend to explore in the future, I think is certainly uh, a very useful uh, vehicle uh, to explore through the provisional patent application process. The other one is just as a um, just as a cost deferral mechanism. You know, I don't want to uh, be cavalier, and, and certainly there are reasons why you need to be more thorough early in the process with the provisional patent applications, but especially for smaller organizations that are trying to um, plant that flag um, and, and pursue things over the next year, I think it really can be an effective way of allowing the smaller enterprises the ability to secure some protection without incurring and really taking on the profound investment that, uh, far more profound investment that represents filing what is the uh, later utility application that's required in order to receive a, a granted US patent. Next slide, please. So I think we really talked about the environment with which, um, you know, first, why you want to get one on file and the environment in which you can get one on file, how it's really complementary in terms of securing an exclusive right in a patent relative to the innovation you're, you're pursuing um, under a government contract. I think it's important to speak to maybe how a patent can be used to secure competitive leverage and licensing opportunities. Um, certainly with direct competitors, Earlier, we touched upon the fact that you could secure a patent in, in less than a year going forward. I, th I think that that's really powerful. Um, again, the ability to uh, show a direct competitor that, in fact, you've got a patent that bears on a particular technology area can be used to realize immediate leverage. Um, and, and not everything necessarily involves um, going into district court and, and filing a lawsuit, right? Oftentimes, merely um, you can engage in licensing discussions if, if you can project the leverage you have through. A granted patent that can be just as effective in many cases as, as actually going into the district court. Other things that I've seen used successfully, um, a grant patent portfolio and a granted patent can be used to, to manage upstream and in downstream suppliers and, and customers, right? If, if you want to steer the technology in a particular direction, I think it's important to acknowledge that, um, you know, that patents can be, you know, given the leverage you have to the patent system, it can be used to, to manage that network of people that are in your, your business environment, right? It's, it's a it's a business document used to, to realize the transactions you need for the business to be successful. And so are really perceiving how a patent can give you leverage in that in that context, I think can be, can be quite valuable. 
one of the things maybe I'll, I'll ask uh, Matt and Joel to maybe speak to um, that's often come up is what is the role of a patent relative to opportunities for um, you know, sole source environments, right? Where, where you argue that you're the, the only organization or that has a specialized expertise in order to fulfill a particular government contract. So I'll, I'll pause there and uh, maybe Joel or, or Matt, first if you want to maybe speak to the role of, of patent and and pursuing and realizing the sole source justification. Matt, did you want to take that initially and then I could chime in? Sure, I'll, I can start us off there. So, um, you know, the government is, is really looking out for number one, right? What's good for the government. And if you, through your patent filings and your, your IP protection, can show that you have um, demonstrated a particular expertise uh, in an area, and, and you can show that because you have the patents for it, um, and and then you know you may be able to make the argument to the government that the only solution that's available is one that requires use of your IP, um, and because you have the patents for it, you have the expertise for it, um, and that pitch goes a long way to uh, to achieving a sole source contract. Joel, I know you have some particular experience with that. Yeah, so I, and, and maybe we can even broaden it, uh, uh, you know, a, a bit, so, you know, so a bit wider, I guess, because we've been, you know, we've been talking about patents, which is which is fine, but I, I think Matt, you hit you hit the you hit it on the head in terms of IP, right? So the really you want to point to technical expertise in a, in a particular area, right? If the government's looking for, you know. 5G radios for tactical communications, then you want to point to Maybe your, you know, your IP assets in the, in the 5G telecom space. Obviously, you also want to point to your 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 team, right? Your engineering team, um, and their expertise um, in in the in the in the technology space. So it's it's really identifying a a core expertise in an area that's important or essential to the deliverable that the government is seeking. Obviously, uh, patents can can help with that, um, and is certainly strong. Um, but I think you know, you could sort of open it up to the larger tech data description, right? If the government is looking for a production contract for, uh, you know, a thousand 5G radios, then, you know, you should be able to point to manufacturing documentation and and uh, test sheets and, and, and sort of design processes that highly demonstrate your ability to, to effectively, uh, you know, deliver those those 5G radios quickly and, and on schedule. So, um, you know, I just wanted to sort of make make that point. It, it's it's really an exercise in identifying you know the core expertise that you have, such that the the the, the government can justify either you know awarding the contract to you based on a sole source designation or um, uh, or something related to that. Yeah, and I'm, I might also add that um, you know the technology area here matters. Um, in areas where there is, uh, where, where the technology area is very crowded and there are a lot of players in the field that have um, expertise and, and IT in an area, you know, your arguments for sole source are not going to be as good. Um, but if you have IT that really represents a step change in, in the field, um, maybe it's a, a new optics system on a scope, right? And, and you can demonstrate that you have a, um, you know, a, a market advantage over your competitors. Um, it's going to be difficult for them to compete, um, and uh, you know a, a sole source contract could be coming your way just because you have uh, IT and demonstrated expertise in in some sort of step change technology. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Um, Roy, the last point I'd like to make on the slide, and we'll certainly touch upon it, but but some of the larger uh, licensing opportunities we touched upon in the earlier slides, not just the headline verdicts, but, but the licensing campaigns behind the, related to some of the litigation, really tied to licensing opportunities that went beyond the vertical, right? So if somebody is trying to focus on a very particular government niche and, and they're solving something that perhaps the government identifies as a, a mission requirement earlier than the commercial sector, for example, certainly I, I think the headlines we, we showcased earlier speak to the value of those um, opportunities relative to uh, judgments that were awarded or um, you know settled 
but I, I think it's important to note that the market opportunity outside that particular vertical, once it impacts the commercial sector, you know, typically it's a few more years down the road, but from my perspective, often represents far more valuable opportunities. And I think a classic example is cybersecurity, right? I, I think the government has been a, a pioneer in trying to accelerate research through cybersecurity. And yet, if you look at the, frankly, the overall market opportunity for cybersecurity beyond government, it um, I think really speaks to the value of, of licensing, licensing uh, moving beyond their vertical. So, next slide, please. So, uh, I'll touch briefly on licenses here and and IT's role in license. So, as I said earlier, every, every agreement every agreement really is uh, unique. It's a unique balancing act, and there really is no one size fits all for every uh, for every problem. Of course, how IP rights are allocated in a license agreement is, is often a key dispute. Uh, it's a key point of negotiation, um, and having your own IP is a big source of leverage. Um, and so, really, I, I, I'd like people to take away with the idea that that IP is is two different things here. It's leverage, but it's also proof of expertise um, and and development. They can help you get your foot in the door to even get the license in the first place. Um, some considerations when when you're licensing with a with a contractor that is maybe above or, or even below you in the chain is, um, are you paying for development or, or is the payment really for some sort of use or scale up? And this matters because if somebody's paying you for development, then you know there's more of an expectation that they're going to get some rights to that you know, foreground IP uh, as we typically call it. But if you have your own IP that you're bringing to the table, you know, we, we call that background IP, and that's IP that can be carved out um, of, 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 you know, whatever this future development effort is. And it allows you to retain all of the rights to everything that you've previously developed. We sometimes see uh, clients that have great ideas and they develop things, but they don't really have that IP. And when it's time to do one of these contracts, it becomes very difficult to carve out what's background IP. Whereas if you have IP written down, if you have applications on file or patents that have been granted, uh, you can point to that. Uh, and, it, and it makes it much easier to talk about. Um, it makes it easier to, to, to you know, disclose and, and have conversations about because it's already out there and you already have it protected. With the government, um, there are many of the same considerations. Uh, obviously, development contracts such as DARPA and uh, CIVR contracts uh, carry with them a little bit of a different, um, uh, uh, you know, expectation about who's going to get what rights. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, DARPA and CIVR contracts sort of have the expectation that the company is going to retain uh, at least some rights, maybe maybe even all of the rights, uh, depending on the contract. Um, and then there's this whole by the oil act that that uh, really governs the allocation of rights. Uh, and Tom Holikowski is going to talk to that. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, hello. This is Tom. The by the oil act is uh, critical. Number one, but number two, it also has a real interesting kind of backstory to it. I know a lot of people are familiar with the Gatorade that developed back in the 60s at the University of Florida. And one of the reasons why this act ultimately came about in 1980 was because of a long tussle uh, that the University of Florida and those inventors had with the federal government in terms of trying to establish who had the rights to the Gatorade uh, patents. So that went on for like a good decade, and that, in addition to some other kind of more high-profile sort of disputes, led to this by dole Act, uh, and the, the whole idea behind it is to sort of decentralize uh, the control of patent rights uh, rather than have it completely controlled by the government and completely kind of centralized in one office to, to really kind of open it up. And so, uh, in a, a more sort of 
Jeffersonian kind of approach where the government just sort of gets out of the way uh, and, and relies on an individual kind of initiative. And again, one of the reasons was uh, this concern about uh, contractors and universities not wanting to participate in, uh, in government research because they're worried about losing uh, rights to potentially commercially valuable stuff. And because at that time, the, there was government regulations that uh, typically required the contractors to basically automatically assign all the inventions to the federal government that were related to what they were working on. And the Bayh-Dole Act sort of flipped that around, and, and so it uniformly uh, permits contractors to retain ownership of inventions that are made under the contract. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's important, though, that there's certain provisions in terms of timely disclosing when an invention is made. And so that sort of gets back to some of the discussions earlier on to have a robust sort of patent uh, system and, and approach and strategy in your own company. And so you've got uh, those things in place so that when ideas come up uh, and are identified as being you know, potentially worth uh, pursuing a patent on, that you've got a system to identify them. And then in this case, if you're involved with government research, to notify the government uh, that, hey, we've got this invention, and you want to you know, formally elect to retain that. The next slide. Now, the government also does include a kind of an automatic right for itself uh, to, to use the, the invention. And it's you know, typically not It doesn't lead to too many uh, dis disputes here because it's pretty straightforward. Um, and, but what really where the uh, sort of rubber hits the road is, is what is a subject, quote unquote, subject invention that's uh, going to be subject to this by Dole Act. Because it's, uh, it's inventions that are made of reduced to practice, quote, in the performance of work under a funding agreement. And so what that means is, I know here, that it's very important uh, when you're negotiating these funding agreements, contracts with the government, to identify as carefully as possible the, the scope of the, the work that you're going to be doing, because that's going to control the scope of what inventions automatically get licensed in the US and which don't. And so in addition to, obviously, if you know it's within the scope of the, the contract, to make sure to timely identify and notify the government, uh, even at the outset, uh, being aware of, of what that scope might be and sort of you know, strategically negotiating that is very important for the government. Ultimately, I think uh, most people agree that the Biden Act has been uh, very successful in uh, generating a greater interest in government research and resulting in a, in a increased collaboration uh, between the industry uh, and government. There is, uh, it's not mentioned here, but uh, I know it comes up, you sometimes hear uh, kind of sort of the you know, parade of horribles of uh, you know, some, something called March in rights. And as you may know, because it's been in the news a bit, uh, that's where the government does retain uh, an option to come in and uh, basically grab um, hold of the invention and license it out to someone uh, for them to, to pursue. It's important, though, to know that that's, you know, it's, it's just, it's really not something that has happened. I mean, it's been, it's been an act that's been around for over 40 years, and the government has never actually done, uh, you know, exercised those margin rights. And, and it's really uh, because one of the triggers is that uh, there needs to be a failure by the contractor to take any effective steps to achieve practical application of the inventions at issue. That, that's usually not the case if the invention is worth anything. So I uh, just want to flag that, that you know, when you hear March and Rights and, and people can you know, be concerned about that, it really is not, not a real legitimate concern. Um, all right, next slide. So that gets us to uh, litigation, uh, because if you're 
involved really on either side of the fence here, whether you're working for the government and the government ends up getting sued, or you've, you've done a good job pursuing your patent rights and you have obtained some patents that are being utilized uh, by the government or by the, well, one of the government's contractors. The recourse uh, for people, for any entity that wants to uh, obtain basically more than the $10,000 from the U.S. government is a court in Washington, D.C. called the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. So basically, if you want to check for more than 10000 you got to line up there, and that goes for like a tax case, a contract case, or in this case, what we're talking about is really focusing on patent cases. And so uh, I'm obviously very familiar with this court, as, uh, as Tom mentioned before, that I litigated there for several years while I was at the Justice Department. And, since I've been at Fish, but uh, I've also litigated multiple patent cases there. And the, the thing that uh, I guess uh, is important on, on this slide is it's, it's sort of a, uh, a kind of a theoretical point, but um, the claims, uh, a patent claim in the, in the Court of Federal Claims is actually viewed uh, as a matter of uh, you know, their kind of legal rationale as being a government taking uh, without compensation. And that kind of then ties into the Fifth Amendment. Um, and so, and the reason why that's significant is, uh, maybe we can go to the next slide, um, that the, um, when, when the, that taking occurs, uh, there's certain limitations on the, on the available remedy that, that is available to, uh, to someone who prevails. And that is that it's going to be reasonable royalty damages and not going to get an injunction to, to like stop the government. But the good news is, is that there's normally, uh, when something is uh, being used by the government, for usually for a fairly significant contract, there's uh, very significant damages that are in issues. So most of these cases in the Court of Federal Claims that have had cases are very large. Uh, uh, you know, so there's a lot at stake. Uh, and as I mentioned here, in, in this court, it's sort of a court of special jurisdiction. Uh, all the um, all the claims there are against the, uh, the federal government. And then when these kind of issues come up, these patent issues, uh, the, the government will pull in uh, whatever contractor was involved as a third party intervener. So they get pulled into the case uh, and so that's important, again, to appreciate, uh, and regardless of what side of the fence you're on, is if you're working with the government, obviously you want to make sure the government is well represented because you typically aren't going to have an indemnity obligation that potentially might get get, so you uh, hopefully want to win the case so that, that you don't even have to worry about arguing about that. And on the flip side, if you're the one bringing the case, this type of litigation is potentially some some leverage that you can bring to bear to maybe um, work a way to, to to negotiate a resolution that allows you to become you know, part of the solution uh, as a subcontractor or, or in some other way. So it's it's important either way uh, to actually be familiar with what your options are in, uh, in the U.S. Court of Federal Claims litigation, and uh, we obviously. Uh, help on that uh, in, in many ways. The case is just in terms of uh, timing, a little bit longer than a normal district court case, but one of the upsides is that uh, the judges there uh, do give each case very careful attention, and so you do have an opportunity to sort of cut the case short and, and get a summary judgment, which is sort of a quicker way to win the case uh, by, by filing a motion. Next slide. And that sort of, kind of leads into the, this final slide in the court, and that is that you know, the judges are typically very experienced and sophisticated. Uh, there's nationwide jurisdictions, so there's no issue with obtaining evidence or witnesses that you may need for the case. Um, and uh, they have a great deal of uh, expertise in terms of and the flexibility in terms of scheduling and the procedures they uh, apply 
as I say, I'm very familiar with having litigated there for, for many years. So I think there's a lot of advantages there. Um, and so it's a, it's a great opportunity to, to monetize uh, the patents that, that hopefully uh, you, know, you develop a strategy to obtain. Uh, and so even if you don't, uh, aren't successful getting a contract initially, there's, there's certainly uh, an opportunity to, to get a remedy and uh, to monetize those patents. And then, uh, on next slide, which is uh, the, just to kind of emphasize again that the recovery is reasonable royalty. But the other thing is, is that the Court of Federal Claims is sort of like, uh, as a little bit of an incentive, I suppose. Uh, if you do prevail, you not only, you know, obviously you get, you get a potentially large uh, monetary award, but you will get uh, an award of uh, reasonable fees for uh, witnesses and the attorneys, uh, which, is, which is nice, uh, as long as, you know, if you're relatively you know, a smaller size uh, entity uh, or a nonprofit. So it's, there's some, some, real, some real benefits to, to reading litigation in this particular court. All right, with that, I'll uh, cede the floor, I guess, to Matt, uh, and we can go on to the next slide. Thanks, Tom. So on the slide here, we, we're showing uh, four example um, cases from the Court of Federal Claims. Uh, you can see that there's some big numbers here, 75 million, 15 million, 12, 28 million. Um, and, and that's really just to emphasize, uh, as Tom said, that uh, the Court of Federal Claims, uh, you know, can pay pretty large dollar amounts. Um, the uh, we won't go through all of them here, but the yeah, maybe, maybe just jump in on there, Matt. Because uh, one other thing about since you're in the Court of Federal Claims, you're, you're typically not dealing with uh, an opposing party that is like, not going to settle a case because of spite or some other kind of you know not particularly rational reason. I mean, having worked at the Justice Department, I do know that internally, I mean, if you've brought a claim and it's, there's some real merit to it they're going to want to try to come to a resolution sooner rather than later. So you, you have that benefit as well. You, you're dealing with a very sort of a rational litigant and obviously the, the federal government with, with deep pockets. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Matt. No, that takes time. That, uh, I've, I've had a similar experience in a dispute with the government. Um, they initially put up a, uh, a strong fight, um, but when we really identified the weakness in their case and, and showed them, you know, why they were wrong, why they just, you know, we're not going to prevail. Um, they pretty quickly uh, rolled over and gave us exactly what we were asking for. Um, uh, so yeah, my, my experience is similar to yours in that regard. Um, so the, the table at the bottom of this slide uh, shows the number of cases in a variety of venues um, that, that the uh, top 20 largest defense contractors have been in. Uh, since the year 2000. Um, I have this broken out on the next slide, but let's stay here for a moment. So 29 cases in the Court of Federal Claims, that's CFC. Uh, DCT is District Court, uh, and that's 580 cases in the District Court compared to 29 in the Court of Federal Claims. And so uh, the takeaway from that is, you know, for these companies, it, it, it's, it is certainly more rare for defense contractors to go sue the government than it is to be involved in a district court litigation. Um, uh, and these district court litigations, you know, you can think of as competitor competitor litigation uh, or, or perhaps something involving uh, a non-practicing entity uh, with a patent, but, but most of these are competitor competitor litigation. The next column is ITC. Um, so ITC is, uh, uh, a case brought before the International Trade Commission, uh, and the remedy there is an injunction. You file an ITC case when you want uh, to prevent someone from importing a product that uh, infringes your patent into the United States. And then finally, the PTAB, and the PTAB is the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, and those cases are where uh, a company is, is having their patent challenged uh, back in front of the patent office. Those cases are usually uh, in conjunction with one of the other uh, district court uh, ITC or CFC cases. 
Next slide. Uh, and this just shows the breakout uh, by company. Uh, and, and, you know, you can certainly see that there are some, some of these companies who have had very little litigation and others who've had uh, quite a lot. Um, certainly, some of this litigation is not, uh, you know, purely defense oriented, uh, but quite a bit of it is. Um, and um, uh, certainly something that people need to be aware of uh, as a defense contractor. Uh, sometimes people think, well, I'm just dealing with the government, you know, I don't have to worry about patents and I really don't have to worry about litigation. Uh, it's, it's actually not true at all. Um, you need to be thinking about it. Uh, you need to have a plan for it. And certainly developing your own IP uh, will go a long way uh, to, to a better outcome if that ever shows up at your door. Next slide. And Matt, we... Yeah, go ahead, Joel. Yeah, wanted to uh, jump in briefly um, on the PTAB uh, as a potential uh, litigation form. Uh, I think Tom had some points he wanted to convey on that as well. Um, but just, you know, just wanted to highlight the sort of the potentially cost effective uh, aspects of the PTAB. It's a fairly new forum. Um, it, it came into instantiation with the, with the AIA, uh, American Events Act, back in 2013. But um, it, you know, it, it, it allows you to challenge the invalidity of a, of a patent um, that's asserted against you in district court. Um, and and, and you know, we, you know, we've got sort of, Tom has substantial experience in the, in the PTAB form, I do as well, but I just wanted to, we just wanted to highlight that as a potential, um, you know, economical route to potentially making a, a district, a potentially expensive district court litigation go away by getting uh, an invalidity um, decision from the PTAB. Tom, did you have anything to add on that? No, Joel, thanks. I think you made a very effective point there, which is um, compared to maybe what we would have seen 20 years ago with patent litigation in, in these industries, the the PTAB, the Administrative Court of the Patent Office, can be a very effective way of, of um, if nothing else, uh, buying yourself 18 months of patent peace to deal with uh, while you work through validity issues. Just a very effective form as well. Um, certainly, we could uh, provide a whole other hour uh, webinar on litigation finance and, and how do you manage and and address expenses, and, and especially for a mid-tier and smaller actor, how do you uh, how do you embark upon licensing and litigation? But, but that really is a, a topic for another day. Um, thank you, everyone. This has been a wonderful audience today. We've got a number of questions that that came in, and we certainly uh, tried to answer as many of those as we could. Um, I know we're approaching the end of our time. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending our webinar. We'll post an on-demand replay as soon as possible at fr.com. And finally, if you have any questions regarding CLE credit, please email our FISH MCLE team at mcleteam at fr.com. Please visit fr.com for more information.